Welcome back. It's Swing Pass. I'm Adam. That's Daniel. The 2023 season is three days away, so it's time to preview the divisions. This is our big 2023 divisional preview podcast, and we've got eight prompts in kind of a buy or sell format that we need to get through, so we're just going to jump right into it. We don't got no pretense, no how anyway. So, we're just going to start right in alphabetical order, starting with the Central Division. Can the Chicago Union three-peat as division champions? They've represented the Central the past two seasons in 2021 and 2022, obviously helmed by a much different team now that the league's all-time leading assist leader, Pavel Giannis, has departed for LA. But... This is still a really solid union team heading into 2023. They still have a fantastic coaching staff helmed by Dave Woods and Sarah Nolik, Ross Barker, Andrew Shogren, Sam Kaminsky hold down an offense, excuse me, Jack Shanahan too. I know I'm going to forget some names as I'm trying to do Paul this. Arters. We'll throw Paul Arters. Paul Arters yeah. are locking down this offense. They've added Christian Johnson over the offseason. There was some speculation about Nate Goff possibly leaving. The team announced recently that he will be returning to the team, joined by Jace Brunner, who is a captain this year, John Jones, Asher Lance, and a deep and committed defensive core. The Union seem like a pretty solid team, but it does seem like their ceiling has diminished just a bit, allowing other teams like Indianapolis, Minnesota, and Madison may be able to close the gap. Daniel, Buy or sell Union as three-peat champions of this division. They would become the fifth team ever to three-peat or represent three straight seasons for a division at Championship Weekend, joining the New York Empire, Toronto Rush, Madison Radicals, and Dallas Legion as the other four franchises. It's so tough because I just... It's hard to know what they're going to look like until we actually see them play without Pavel. Like... Not having the rock that has been the backfield and has been the face of the franchise for the past several seasons has led the whole ascension we've seen with this team. Like, it is the most significant piece that they have lost this year. And I agree with you. When you, like, list all their names and, like, their potential starting O-line, potential starting D-line, it really doesn't seem like they've lost so much, especially with Pavel almost not taking a step back necessarily, but, like, allowing other guys to shine offensively the way he has the past couple seasons like they do have the talent and the experience to still play at the top of this division all that being said I am going to sell the Chicago Union as three-peating meaning I do not see them doing it this year I think when it just comes to the central I see Indy as being the most consistent team having the fewest question marks Coming out of this offseason, I think their roster is going to be slightly better. I think their young guys are going to continue to improve. They're getting Travis Carpenter back. So right now, Indy is my pick for the division champion. But it would not surprise me if Chicago does continue to surprise me year after year and put it all together and get there. But I am not taking them to win the Central this year. Man, I, I think they've got like our faces on a dartboard in the club. I hope they do. Yeah, this is more more motivation the way that we just every keep year keeping this stuff onto the union. You know, I had my doubts, especially when Nate Goff was obviously a question mark, but I kind of agree with you. I think that full strength Chicago Union look pretty comparable to previous seasons. Obviously, they're never gonna replace a player like Pavel. Sam Kaminsky was even on a podcast earlier this week talking about how they have no intention of replacing a Giannis in their lineup. They they realize that that is a fool's errand. And so like you say, I'm really interested to see like what this optimal cutting core that maybe features Barker, Arter, Shogren, Shanahan can really churn out. Like what does that be? Which is loaded like? what, to be fair. Like that's a loaded cutting core. Yeah. But you know, Arters has been kind of a part-time player the past two seasons. He's incredible when he starts but Mm -hmm. there are games and he's not going to be there. And is that going to be a matchup against an Indy, a Minnesota, you know, a a Madison, potentially even a Pittsburgh team. If they get some momentum this year, you know, they're a big question mark. They're returning a couple veterans. They're starting rotations similar to Chicago. If you look at it, right. Thunderbirds look kind of attractive at times, but anyways, I'm getting aside from the point I'm buying Chicago. I, I know that I've been 
doubtful of them, particularly in the wake of the Giannis departure news and everything. And obviously it's just sort of been my deal the past two off seasons is questioning this Chicago franchise. But listening to Kaminsky the other day, knowing how much preparation this coaching staff puts into this roster week in, week out, um, I, I just, I have faith in this team. I have trust in what they do. You know, you talk about Indy having that continuity from last season. I think Chicago still got that. And I think that this Giannis thing, obviously you're never going to replace his talent, but it gives them another bit to chomp on, right? Like last year, they sort of had the doubt of nobody believes in us. We lost a few players from our semifinals team in 2021. We look a little bit different this year. Minnesota looks stronger. You know, we need we need to show that we're the actual champions of this division. Then they went out and did that. And I think similarly, you're going to see a motivating factor with the Giannis departure where mm -hmm. the union say, hey, no one's going to believe in us. Everyone thinks that we were this team built specifically off of Pavel. Let's go and show them wrong. You know, and the union are fantastic at showing people wrong, even if even if they still are phenomenally talented, that mindset is just. I think right. so important and they, they have a confidence we've talked about before. Like this team has been winning a lot the past two seasons and they're not shying away from that. You know, they've got 23 regular season wins the past two seasons. I don't think it's totally out of the possibility if they kind of avoid an injuries bug for them to reach double digits again, this regular season. Yeah. I mean, Right. It, it's There's no wrong pick right now when it comes to the top of the central, but I do want to get your thoughts on Indies. So let's pivot to our other buy or sell sure. question. Sure. Are you buying or selling Indy having the most efficient offense in 2023? So for context, they finished as, what was it, the eighth best offense ninth, last ninth year? Ninth overall offense, second best in the central last year. Second Chicago best in the central. Had the fourth best offense. And we're nearly eight percentage points better than Indianapolis. Right. So, Third like, yeah, how do you see between the, the top five most efficient teams last year and everyone else? It was just right. It was so, like, when it when it comes to the question of like, yeah, how much does Chicago drop off? How much does Indy improve if they do improve at all? Getting back Travis Carpenter obviously is the big boost to that offense. So, what do you see for Indy this season? So. I think I will buy Indy being the most efficient offense in this division. I do think Chicago's efficiency numbers from the past two seasons will depreciate, obviously not only because of the loss of Pablo Giannis, but also Kyle Rutledge. Last year, he was such an important playmaker and glue piece for them. He just seemed to fill whenever they needed him to and was so good at making the big play in the big moment. I think they're going to miss that a lot. I think they're going to be a little bit more of like what Pavel kind of described them a few seasons back as being shooters and bucket getters. I think that's going to be a mindset that prevails on the union. I think that they're going to take opportunity when it is presented to them. I don't think they're, they're going to be gun shy and kind of looking downfield. And I think they have a lot of good continuation weapons to engage in that kind of attack. But I don't think it's going to be as efficient. And kind of to your point earlier, this indie offense is the most stable rotation in the division right now, right? Like this is mm -hmm. going on year three, even like year four or five or six of kind of the same basic core of, well, Travis Carpenter is back now, but you've got the young guy, Lucas Conieris stepping in as a great, great pivot handler. But then Rick Gross, Levi Jacobs, Cameron Brock, these guys have been doing it for years and they're going to do it again. Um, I just, especially also with that indoor atmosphere, they get such a confidence boost playing at home. Keegan North turns into an all AUDL competitor <laughs> in that environment. They just, yep. they, they have, they have, I think at their base, the most consistent reset offense in the division, but they also have a lot of explosives. And I think that kind of balance just plays out really well going into this 2023 campaign where every other offense has a host of questions and kind of are all redesigning on the fly. I mean, we just talked about Chicago. Madison has completely retooled their offense this off season. Minnesota is entirely reconstructing theirs after losing Andrew Roy and Cole Jurek. Now going to be building around Abe Coffin, which should turn out really well for them, but still presents a lot of questions. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I'm buying indie kind of to your point earlier of they're consistent and we know what to expect for them. And that's what I want for my offense. I want to know that you can go out there 20 times in a game and basically give me the same effort level every single time out there. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I'm also buying indie as the most efficient offense. I mean, like you said, it's really just about them having the fewest questions, the fewest doubts about that offense, whereas we see these expected changes in the other top teams in the division. So I think with Indy, like obviously their defensive efficiency was kind of their their bread and butter last year. I mm-hmm. see them kind of shifting back to more of an offensive identity this year where like that is going to be the driving force of a lot of their wins and what sets them apart from the rest of the Central. The question is... Wait, wait, like, wait, wait. To your point, though, like that Indy offense stepped onto the field and converted a lot of those breakout that's true. opportunities last year. Indy was that one is of good to know. teams in taking those timeouts, subbing in the offensive unit, and letting Cam Brock go get, right? Like they've got right. the all-time leading goal scorer. Let's just use him. I, I like another thing that comes up with Indy. They're, they're kind of like a simple offense. They use the weapons how mm-hmm. you want to use them. Cam Brock goes out there, scores all the goals. That's what you want him to be doing. Works They're not well. putting him yeah. in a situation where he's having to make a whole bunch of decisions. Now, that isn't to say that Cameron Brock hasn't developed into a really good continuation throw. He completed over 96% of his throws last year. But, you know, you see you see Levi Jacobs in the shooter role. You see Connie Harris being that reliable pivot. You know, you see these players stepping into the roles that they're meant for and North being able to kind of pick and choose where he goes. I I just, there, that simpleness, that, that basicness of, Hey, this guy is good at a given thing. Let's just let him go do that. I think teams get too cute and get away from that at times. I, I I don't quite want to name names, but there's other teams in this division (laughs) who do that. Right. And I, (laughs) you can name names, Minnesota and Madison, man. I just feel like they have, they have options available and they oftentimes get into these drives where you're just going move attack, like go downfield, like get the disc into Quinn Snyder's hands, like do something, you know, like I feel like the alley cats have such an understanding of like the end of these drives oftentimes result in Cameron Brock getting the goal. And there's just that inevitability. And I think that that yeah. plays really well for an offense. It's it's kind of like Carolina in their backfield, you know? Like, you know, sure. all Yannick and Matt Gutjohannes are bringing to the table every game. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that, like, Indy never seems to have to work out any kinks in their offense because it's been the same core year after year. But the question kind of in the back of my mind is, like, when it comes to playoff time, given a full season of working out the kinks and like developing these new offenses in Minnesota, in Madison, in Chicago, like I don't know for sure if Indy is going to have the most efficient offense at the end of the season, like in a specific game. But I think season long, start to finish, they seem to me as the most consistent pick for now. Right. So, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that we're both coming at this from like a season long. Right, you know, right, right, right. But like, who by knows the by the season, end of the year? The Union offense might be the best. Or, you know, like Minnesota, like Abe Koff, could, yeah, singular Playoff talent. Abe. At the end of this year, like if they just kind of give the keys over and say, hey, Abe, throw 50 times a game, like <laughs> that works out really well historically. It will probably work. Dallas made yeah. a championship appearance doing that, so. Yeah. So let's let's close our Central Division talk with our, our playoff picks. Okay. You go first. Okay. Focus, focus. Wait, I have to go first. Fine, you want right. me to go I'll, first? I'll just, I'll just you tweeted yours out, out anyway. I'll, I'll rip it's the public info. Up quick. Uh, Chicago yeah. first, uh, Indianapolis second, Minnesota third. I think Chicago will represent the division at championship weekend, as I said earlier in this segment. So, cool. I'm taking Indy with the one seed. They're going to go to championship weekend, and then Chicago with the two seed, Minnesota with the three seed. Okay. Sorry, Madison. Yeah. I know that. Well, we should report uh, learning yesterday in a Madison Radicals preview article for their upcoming game this weekend against the Pittsburgh Thunderbirds. The team has said that Kevin Pettit Scantling might have suffered an ACL injury at a recent practice. He is expected to miss at minimum six to eight weeks, it sounds like. So losing a leader of that capacity for a Radicals team that has kind of had that exact same injury shadow hanging over some of their 
prime playmakers these past couple of seasons, it's yeah. it's going to be hard. We'll see how Madison motivates, but you know, they were already kind of this tweener team anyways with how Indy Chicago and Minnesota have been playing these last few seasons. So yeah, yeah it's mean, also, I, it's just going to like, it's going to force them to lean that much more on their offense, which every year we have so many questions about the radicals <laughs> offense. So it's still going to be wait and see mode with them. It's redesigned. It's redesigned. Again. Redesigned, it's new system. They got new pieces. Yeah. yeah. Starting to get etch a sketch designs in here, but uh, <laughs> let's, let's move on. We're moving on to the East division. Uh, our first topic in our buy or sell buy or sell Daniel Philadelphia Phoenix as the lock for the third seed and the final playoff spot in this East division. Ugh, this is this is an annoying one because I I buy Philly as the third best team in the East, the third most talented team, the team I view as having the best shot at taking New York or DC, stealing a game from yeah. one or both of those teams. But they're not the favorite for the three seed because of scheduling. Like I have to give Toronto the current favorite for the three seed. They play. Five games this year. They've got three games against Montreal. Then they've got a Pittsburgh and a Detroit game. This is Toronto. So Toronto, in my mind, has like five games that I basically lock in as wins for them. Obviously, it's not for sure, but Montreal, I I do not think it's going to be good at all this year. Toronto has also added pieces. I also don't think the margins were that significant last year between Toronto, between Boston, between Philly. All those teams were kind of beating up on each other. And so for Philly to to be considered like a clear-cut favorite in the games they play against Toronto and Boston and Montreal, I just don't really see that happening. So yeah, it's really, it's just like the math doesn't work out for Philly. They have to play Carolina. They've obviously got the games against New York and DC. Yeah, wait, does Toronto only play New York once? That's the that other up? part of their schedule. Yeah, they face That's them the right thing. away at the beginning. They get that loss out, out of the way early, and then it's kind of <laughs> right, right. Then they don't have to think really about favorable it. Favorable schedule. That was the other thing I meant to mention. Yeah. That with Chicago too. They have a really favorable schedule this year. They played Detroit a handful of times. They get a lot of Pittsburgh matchups. I like the year yeah. kind of just softening or chewing up on that soft schedule. I should say. Yeah. So anyway, back to the point, like I I'm currently selling at Philly being the favorite for the three seed solely based on schedule. Again, I do think they're the third most talented team in the division, but I just don't see it. I don't know. I mean, the three seed right now, I, I expect to be like a six and six team, basically. Maybe Toronto can get to seven and five, but it seems like, you know, they'll be right at the same level as they were last year. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to sell it, and for the exact same reasons I tweeted about it yesterday, it just comes down to strength of schedule, excuse me, uh, for me. I, I think that Philly is absolutely the third most talented team, but as we've seen so many times in this league's history, talent only gets you so far. Like You do need to rely a little bit on matchup strength and just what is coming down the road at you in terms of your schedule. And sure. I think with Philly having like an interdivisional game against Carroll, Lina. Granted, the Flyers will be on the second game of a back-to-back, but that is a tremendous task. Uh, and, and to your point, I do think that while Philly, on a certain kind of talent level, has pegged out that third niche in the division just behind New York and D.C., the results, as you said, were much closer, I think, than maybe we talk about between Philly, Boston, and Toronto. Those teams yeah. just kind of continue to ankle bite on each other and Boston in particular they just match up well with the Phoenix like they always kind of give them a run for their money Philly won the latter of the two matchups last year but if you remember Boston won the week one season opener at home against the Phoenix it was an Orion Cable game or yeah it was an Orion Cable (laughs) game Boston was just like airing it out all the time Philly's trying to match it with uh, Jordan Ryan and Bryce Dunn were going off that game. James Pollard mm-hmm. was making his kind of like offensive debut. It was just like hucking everywhere. It was a fun um, one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that until Philly shows an ability to contain offenses like Boston and Toronto a little bit better, uh-huh. I can't give them that just easy path towards the third seed. I think those teams are still very much in contention against them. And 
I generally agree with your take on Montreal, but I do think that they're going to get some starters back for some of those games, particularly maybe against Toronto, who aren't listed on their current roster, like some Iwan okay. Cojonaire, some Jacob Brissett, you know, some of if those they get players. those guys, if they get then those yeah, guys it's anyone's for, guess. For the rivalry matchup between Rush Royale, like, sure, they could take one off, you know, and Montreal would love nothing, nothing more than to throw a giant wrench into the Rush's rehabilitation, right? Like, these teams go back, man. Like, they were basically, like, Montreal was founded as basically a rival for Toronto. And and yeah. they pegged so many of their seasons, even without getting to the playoffs around beating the Rush, who at that point were perennial championship weekend attendees. So I, I could totally see Montreal kind of hanging their hat on a rebuilding year around taking Toronto's legs out when they can't afford to lose a game in a tight playoff race. So... I, yeah, I don't know. East East is, I think, maybe one of the more reliable divisions for an upset that just sort of flips everything a little bit further than we had expected. Yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, that kind of leads into our next question. Are you buying or selling this that the East Division is strictly a two team race at the top? New York and DC. Like, does anything else matter in this division? Is another way to put this buy or sell question. Uh... I'm selling for this season about anything. Like, like I think the teams will give DC <laughs> and New York a run for their money. I even think, yeah, I even think New York might not reach ten wins given their schedule. Really? Like they, they. I mean, it's tough. Colorado. They've got Atlanta. Like, if they slip up, if they drop both of those and lose one other time to DC or Philly one time or Toronto right. makes some kind of crazy game out of it, like. I don't know, but like in in terms of, do I expect any team outside of DC and New York to challenge those two teams in a playoff scenario in a must win game? Not in twenty twenty three, man. <laughs> no, yeah. have you seen New York and DC? They're, <laughs> they're super teams. Like those are all star <laughs> rosters. I legitimately yeah. struggle to think of like guys I would take off some of their starting rotations for any stars on other teams. So. Like, New York and D.C. are just in a league of their own right now, and I think that the East Division title game this year could serve as kind of a de facto championship in in certain terms. Now, I'll pause there and say that I think Colorado (laughs) and whatever team emerges from the South are also going to be absolute championship contenders, and whoever wins the true title this year is the true champion. But D.C. New York in a second straight East Division title game, I mean, that's just... That's money. That's money. That's yeah. a that's a that's a matchup you dream about. I I agree with you. Well, I I'm actually you said sell on this one, but then you kind of talked yourself into buying it. I like I, oh, I buy the sorry. fact. I, that I, I think I, I think I botched the answering. So <laughs> okay. I buy that there is not a team outside of New York and DC yes. that will challenge those two teams. Okay. Yes, that is those what I agree with. Like average. to me. To me, the East Division, whatever happens during the regular season, whatever, it's going to be New York and D.C. in the East Division Championship game. And like you said, I, I view that as somewhat of a, a quasi-championship uh, game for the UDL this season. I don't... It, I was just going to say, and if ahead. it's not... If it's not those two teams, and boy, we're going to have some storylines that shoot through. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't... And <laughs> like win-win. I said, I don't... Like you said, I don't want to count out like Philly or Toronto or probably just one of those two teams from maybe taking a game from DC or New York in the regular season. It's fully possible. We saw how close Philly played DC last year in those two games. Obviously they lost both, but by a single goal in each of those regular season meetings, Philly, they're not going to be any worse than last year. And I know DC is getting a good amount better with, with their depth at the very least, but Philly can be right there with them but I still think like playoff scenario you trust the teams that have been there before and so to me it's it's like just let's just skip to the the East Division championship at this point I'm not skipping anything man we've got what I know I don't I don't want to skip and I think seven I don't want to skip I'm just not I'm just not gonna put so much weight on like any regular season meeting in the East 
Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I could almost see DC and New York taking a little bit of a passive approach against some of those teams and saying, hey, we're not going to show you the full look, you know? Like, sure, sure. But we'll see. I, I just feel like New York was such a show of force last year. I, I wonder if they can. Oh, yeah. That. We, we've talked about that a number of times they... about how different the 2019 <laughs> Empire were from the 2022, both undefeated yeah. teams, both claiming the oh. championship, but like. New York's game against Empire. Toronto. New York beat Toronto mm-hmm. like twenty-five to eight or something like that last year. You remember that? They just like they were stomping opponents. But yeah, in twenty nineteen, every game was again. like five goal wins or like yeah, their their margin of average margin of victory in twenty nineteen was significantly lower. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's pivot. To another division then, a division that will have a lot of heat at the top of it, the South Division. And the first question we have for our buy or sell slate is, buy or sell the number one seed from the South Division, or I'm sorry, buy or sell the number one seed from the regular season in the South Division who will host a playoff game will Mm -hmm. not make championship weekend in 2023. So the regular oh, wait, we, South Division champion will not represent the South at championship. Real, real quick, rapid fire. Let's let's say our playoff seeds from the East. I've got New York one, oh, DC yeah. two, Toronto three. I've got DC one, New York two, Toronto three. Cool. Regardless, doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, the one seed in the South. I think we both agree, based on scheduling, again, not to overall talent necessarily of the teams, but it seems like Austin should be considered the favorite for the one seed. So to me, this question is just like, assuming Austin gets the one seed, is this their year to go to championship weekend? Mm-hmm. I I want it to be. I'm gonna. I'm buying. I'm, I'm buying Austin going to championship weekend. As the one seed, this is going to be such a tight race at the top of this division, man. Like, I I think the advantage that they're going to have is just the fact that they only have to play one playoff game against either Carolina or Atlanta, and they're doing it in Austin. They beat both those teams in Austin last year. They split games in the regular season series because Austin had that one weekend where they went out to Carolina and Atlanta Dropped both of those. They were close games, but then they held their own in Austin. So I I do see Austin getting marginally better this year. I see Carolina probably staying the same realistically, even though they have had a good amount of offseason losses, but a couple notable key additions like Joe White, Ben Snell, Liam Searles, Bose. Like it's it's hard to see, you know, whether Carolina goes up or down. And then Atlanta, we talked about it before, like they're still kind of in prove it mode for us. I view them as an elite team for sure, but we just haven't seen them put it all together with any sort of real consistency over the past few seasons. So I think while they have it in them, Austin just feels like the team that I'm trusting most right now with the trajectory we've seen from them over the past few years. They went from three wins in 2019 to six wins in 2021, nine wins last year. It's a 12-win season for Austin coming up in 2023, according to that trend. That's not my pick. They'll, they'll, but I do think they'll win 10 games in the regular season. Um, so, yes, I'm buying Austin going to championship weekend as the one seed. Lock it in. I'm selling. Uh, I, I agree with you that I think that Austin will win the regular season in the South Division. But or, I'm sorry. I... I <laughs> This is why I don't do actual stocks, because I think we screwed up how that was supposed to go. I think you were supposed to sell, because I think you're supposed to... No, you buy... No, you're like buying into... You're buying into an idea. I'm buying into the fact that the one seed... Right, the question was that the one seed will not make... Oh, okay. You're right. I'm selling that all the way. You're you're buying it. You're buying Austin. You're buying stock in Austin, (laughs) but you are selling this question. Yes, yes. We went with the negative yeah. in the question for whatever reason. <laughs> yes. That's fine. I am buying this question, and I agree with you. I think Austin will finish with nine or ten regular season wins. I think that they will claim the one seed in the South. But I think, as opposed to maybe Toronto or Chicago, where those teams might benefit a little bit from a softer schedule and kind of a contentious pack, with mm-hmm. basically 
how the South division is structured with three playoff bids among five teams and the three teams at the top kind of looking like locks for those bids. Mm -hmm. I think that the soul soft schedule will come back and bite them pretty badly. And I just keep getting this inkling in my head that this starts to feel like 2021 Carolina all over again, where that Flyers team started 0-2 with two tough losses to Atlanta. And then was it Boston or DC? DC. They lost to Atlanta and DC to open the season. And then they went 8-2 in the back 10 games of their season. They had a six-game winning streak at one point. And then lost the final game of the regular season to the Breeze, double overtime. Just and they they lost to New York in their in the regular season too. Before yeah, also in double overtime, they had just this battle test mantra. And then they got into the playoffs, and you just saw their ability to adjust and execute was simply above the competition, including New York, who in 2021 benefited just a little bit much from that increased Atlantic Division schedule that allowed them like a a couple more weeks of off time than I felt like Carolina experienced in the same slate. So Mm -hmm. this is all to say that like, I think Austin is an incredible team. I absolutely agree with you. I'm a little bit worried about what they're going to look like versus Atlanta and Carolina, who will just have had such opportunities to play test against the best competition that this league has to offer. You know, like I, I think that, the Flyers' like playoff pedigree too is really going to come through this season. We've talked consistently throughout this show about teams that we can rely upon. I still think that in the South Division, that is the Carolina Flyers' number one with a bullet because Atlanta has no postseason wins, or excuse me, they have one postseason win in 2016, and Austin has zero postseason mm. wins. So Flyers, Flyers got that little bit of just you know. Say it with your chest. Like, we, we've we been here. We're about this. We do this, you know? And I, I think that it, it, they, they, they like that. They like, similar to Chicago, I think that they like having a team that's always kind of regarded as maybe being a little bit hyped above them coming into each season. Like, they want mm-hmm. that. And in fact, uh, Mike Denardis is even in the Tuesday Toss, head coach of the Carolina Flyers, talking today at, at the ADL.com, go read Evan Lovely's latest Tuesday toss. He's talking today about how the Flyers players have been maligning a bit a softer schedule and how they're really looking forward to the gauntlet that is the 2023 Carolina schedule. So they got what they asked for. It's fair. The Flyers can execute, and frankly, I expect them to. Like, they're a damn yeah. good team. They're a damn, damn good team. They are they are definitely going to be more battle-tested than Austin this year, that's for sure. Unless Houston surprises us all. Which well, brings us to our next question. Are you buying or selling Houston getting at least one win against one of our three expected playoff teams, Austin, Carolina, or Atlanta? Can Houston get one win against any of them? Yes, I'm buying that. I think Houston is going to pull off one upset against one of those teams. Which one? No clue. Uh, it's really got to be like lineup dependent and how Houston's playing and what sort of style they come out with, you know, there's just, there's so many questions and this, this trifecta of Austin, Atlanta and Carolina are so established in terms of their playmakers and everything. I need to get a sense of what Houston can do well to possibly shut down some of these opposing attacks or conversely make some inroads against these great defenders on their opponent Mm -hmm. opposing teams. But I, I think Houston will come into 2023 similar to how Madison came into 2013. They're not going to have a whole bunch of the headline stars that we're used to. They're going to be uh, out favored in a majority of their games to start the season against some of their divisional foes. But I think with their buy-in and their team chemistry and just with talking with their head coach Bex forth, I just have a confidence in their identity and their culture. And I think that that's mm-hmm. worth something. I don't know that that's like a playoff appearance in this league, but I think that that's a handful of wins. And I just think with how the South scheduling works, getting one of those teams into a Texas doubleheader or something, and maybe the Havoc can kind of pick them off then, that would be really advantageous for H-Town. So yeah, I'm buying. I'm buying Houston being an upset favorite and making some sort of chaos in the South Division playoff picture. 
Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm buying. And I, I think it's probably just because we talked to Bex a few weeks ago. But I just, I don't know. I, I trust her her instincts as a coach. And it, it does seem like they're maybe doing things a little bit differently in Houston. It sounds like they might go in with pretty fluid O and D lines. They still have a good amount of guys that have a UDL experience with Austin, with Dallas. So it's not like they're going in as like a completely cold new franchise team. Um, so I, I don't know. I guess I just trust that at some point they will surprise one opponent that maybe takes them a little bit uh, too much like an easy win. So, I, you know, four games against Austin, that gives them a lot of time to, to learn Austin and like adjust to their tendencies. Maybe Austin, maybe they catch Austin on like an off week with their roster. So I, I do think uh, Houston will get at least one win, but probably just one win against one of those three teams. Yeah, it'll be interesting for to see how Austin handles this increased load of expectations too. You know, they're not a team that's ever right. entered the season with this much hype. They've always been kind of the the little brother to a respective teams in their own division for a while. It was Dallas. More recently, mm-hmm. it's been the Flyers. Now the Senate feels like they're kind of spreading their wings a little bit more, but maybe Houston can kind of, you know, slip them up a little bit, kind of play that role that, the soul played for so many seasons to Dallas and just work to be that thorn in their side. Yeah, I can see it. All right. Playoff. Speaking, I, I had the transition, the thorn in their side. I was going to transition into Pavel Giannis in the West. We need playoff picks West for the South. You're, ah, you're skipping our, you're fine, skipping our fine, predictions. Fine. I hate making real quick. Picks. We go rapid fire. All right. Uh, New Year's. Austin, Atlanta, Carolina, but I think Carolina will represent the South Division and Championship Weekend in 2023. Fair enough. I'm going Austin, Carolina, Atlanta, Austin over Carolina at home to go to Championship Weekend. I will say Austin's two wins in 2022, one each against Carolina and Atlanta, came on back-to-backs for those road teams, for the Hustle and the Flyers, so... I, I would like to push, see push Austin that narrative. Win. Just I, I want to see Austin win a game straight up. They played some right. great games against those teams. They played a great playoff game against the Flyers. They battled through the end of that game. I'm just I'm just saying. Just saying. That's I'm fine. Pointing Carolina out, and Atlanta. That is a they dad should be they, they should be fine point. playing back to backs, though. They're fine. I will say that that Atlanta one, you, you have a good point get to you. about Te- the the Atlanta one in particular. The Atlanta one was significant. Dallas yeah. Dallas strung them out the night before in a defensive struggle, and then they had to go and play like weird... an overtime game in Austin the next night. You could definitely see the Heat just like getting to Atlanta. That, that was probably quarter. like the weirdest road trip we saw last year. Like the fact that Atlanta took or Dallas took Atlanta to overtime, and then Austin needed that like crazy four or five late fourth quarter goal comeback yeah that was a wild Insane. wild took weekend. A fourth quarter comeback for the soul to get that but win they did it atlanta pulled it Atlanta's out got that pulled rematch locked up that's best game was against austin last year too so you know that they feel good in that matchup that's but. true I uh, I messed up the the segue earlier. I had the Sorry. whole thorn in the side comment that Pavlianis made about him moving to LA and getting to play against a bunch of his collegiate teammates in Colorado. Anyways, we now move to the fourth and final division, the West Division, maybe the division with the most questions heading into 2023. We think we know the general order, but there's also teams in the West that could just make a lot of noise that I think that we're not used to seeing. I'm talking maybe specifically about Oakland, but LA's resurgence. There's just so much going on, but I think the biggest catalyst has obviously been Pavel Giannis coming over from Chicago and joining the Los Angeles Aviators. So my buy or sell question to you and to us is, do you buy Pavel Giannis as the 2023 MVP favorite? I wait. Do we want to say favorite overall or just favorite in the West Division? Favorite I overall? Would say, I mean, I think overall. I think in the West it just becomes a little bit. Crazy. All right, all right. I, I mean, mean, like depth and everything. Oakland's going to be a depth team if they become really good. I don't know. Maybe Khalif ignites something crazy in Seattle, and and could happen. 
rockets to the top. Yeah, he's got he's got the hardware to prove that he can do that sort of thing. So yeah, if we're talking league as a whole, considering Powell the MVP favorite, it's so hard because it, it feels so contingent on what happens in the rest of the league. Like I kind of feel like if DC gets past New York, then yes, Pavel becomes the MVP favorite for the entire league, just because I don't view DC as having such a clear-cut MVP candidate. I know we talked about it on our MVP episode. You're a big Johnny Malks believer. I like him too, but I I still think DC's approach is going to be so widespread. Um, But New York, like if they get to, really, if they win the championship, because honestly, if they fall short of the championship, I don't see the MVP coming from New York either. So again, if they fall short of the championship, I would also say Pavel's the favorite. But as of right now, New York is still my championship pick for 2023. So I have to consider either Ryan Osgar or one guy on the other long list of New Buy York players sell. Buy to be sell. the favorite. You've been around this bush. Come on. <laughs> I'm selling. I'm selling Pavel right. being the MVP favorite for the entire right. league because I think the MVP favorite is Ryan Osgar again. I think New York is still just that good. It's still their league to lose at this point, but Pavel is obviously going to have an impact. I'll let you talk about him. <laughs> I, I mean, assume you're buying I'll start, off, I'll start off by saying I'm buying it. I'm buying it. Yeah. I'm buying the Pavel hype. I, you know, I've experienced it firsthand here in Madison for years. It, you know, it, it's just, it's the, the night man cometh. Like he's just inevitable to a certain degree. And I think that he's got this aviators team in lockstep. You just see them online. They're all together. They're all chirping. <laughs> we'll see if the results come sooner than later. I, I, I have a faith in a little bit that they will, but uh, yeah, I, I just think he's that kind of difference maker. You, you, there is not another Pavel Giannis in this league. You don't get a distributor like that on your team. And yet the Aviators are going to have basically the perfect piece, I think, to activate so much of what was already in place that was working well, right? Like they are a team mm-hmm. that had good chemistry and culture last year. They just didn't have some of the playmaking talent to punch with a Colorado or even a Salt Lake and at times even Oakland. They were a good team, but some of the firepower on the top end, they couldn't trade with some of those playoff teams now with Giannis and Valley and Brunker and McDougal and these other additions and just the general kind of boost that that gives you. I mean, when you get to kind of knock down those individual matchups and now get a more favorable matchup for Michael Keoy to exploit for Everest Shapiro to take advantage of, like everything just falls into place. And I think you saw that the last few seasons in Chicago where Giannis kind of helped Mm -hmm. mold that roster. And all of a sudden when they get a Ross Barker, a few more things make sense. When they get a Paul Arters, it allows for Ross to get more advantageous matchups. It allows for a Jack Shanahan to get more advantageous relationships. All of this is to say, I just think that there is an effect that Giannis brings that is singular. And if the aviators start winning in any sort of visible capacity because of that, it just be, it becomes such a clear argument, right? Like, I just think that he's going to put up numbers. Like, I mean, yeah. As much as the dude hates his legacy of stats or whatever, <laughs> like, that's he's what the stat he king. does. He's just, yeah. a, he's a lotto machine. He just has but a little bit of 700 total yards for a given game. Like he, uh, I, I saw someone talking about this with like Jason Tatum in the NBA playoffs where like you watch Jason Tatum sometimes and you go, Oh, he's having like an off night, but you know, he's good for like 40 to the next night. And then you go and look at the night you thought was an off night. And he's got like 26, seven boards, eight assists or something. That's Pavel a lot of times right now. Right? Like we talked earlier yeah. about how it feels like he took a step back or something. I, I think you're right in a certain kind of energy sense. I think he allowed the offense to exist yeah, beyond it's him that he allowed time. others right. He allowed others to like take on really? more of the heavy lifting. I think, and yet he's still second in the league in assists. He's still averaging like 50 completions a game. He's right, still number one in the league or number two in the league in total yardage. You know, yeah. he scored a bunch of goals too. Very casually. career high in goals. Yeah. Just, kind of turning into a fullback in the middle part of his career. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, and he's talked about that too. He's continued to make his pride and self off of developing more skills. Like the Pavel that we know today 
is so much better than the Pavel in say like 2019. Remember what, like, remember yep. when Pavel was in the All Star game in 2019 and he scored the game winning goal in double overtime and went up yeah. line, took Matt Smith yeah. up line, and I remember that moment being like, "Damn, Giannis has got some wheels," you know? He, he, <laughs> it like, was it was like, unexpected. He's always yeah. had the stamina and he's always been able to get open, but that was like that was like an isolation bucket in a playoff game in the NBA. That was taking a good defender at something that they're good at doing, defending speed up line and beating them at that spot. And to that point, I didn't know Giannis had that. That's his bread and butter now. Like, he just abused he showed it a bunch line. Like he'll, last year. He just kind of, like, shoulders pass, and then he's there. And it's easy money for him, you know? And and yeah. that kind of, like, development of skill, he's going to have another wrinkle this year. It's going to be something. I don't know what it exactly is, but he continues to add. So this is all to say, like, Ryan Osgars is going to be phenomenal. Jordan Kerr is going to be phenomenal. Someone from Colorado is going to be a finalist. Philly might have somebody. Minnesota might have Abe Coffin. Chicago might even have Ross Barker. There's going to be tons of good candidates. I just, like, they're not going to be Giannis on the Aviators. They're just not. They're not. So I think, I, I can't remember if I asked this. I think I asked it in our MVP episode, but how far does LA have to get in your opinion, to really lock in Pavel as the MVP. I think I think West Division Championship game. Okay, so like, yeah, like if they Pop come in as a in. as a non one seed, if they win a playoff game, basically, if they were, if they got the one seed and hosted a playoff game, I think that would also yeah. lock it. Like sure, I don't think that's going to happen. But Colorado, like that, yeah. would, that would also be a way to do it. But yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it has to be at least one playoff win. Right. I don't know. No, that sounds right. Weekend, I, I agree. Given that they just had four wins last year, LA did, but like, yeah. Well, cool. Let's move on to our last buy or sell question for the West Division. Buying or selling the West representative winning at least one game at Championship Weekend. This is not something they've done since 2017. You know, the past couple of seasons, it's been San Diego. Last season, or I guess two seasons prior to the last season, it was San Diego. Last season was Colorado. Colorado kind of got embarrassed by Chicago in that yeah. semifinal game. Do you see them winning a game at championship weekend this year? Whoever represents the West? So I do think it's going to be Colorado. And I do think that they will finally win a game back for the West. So I'm, I'm buying that the West will win one game at championship weekend this year. And you're right to say... The last team, the last West team to win a championship weekend game was the 2017 then champion San Francisco Flamethrowers. And at that point, when the Flamethrowers won the 2017 title, the West Division had claimed three of the last four titles. And those are the first four. <laughs> it was the West era of the West Division existing. We all thought we were just like yeah. in for it for years, decades, maybe even <laughs> of West Division reign. And then it just stopped. And I'm kind of curious as to when that talent pool maybe picks back up. If it's mm -hmm. if it's something to do with, like, I don't know, individual playmaking or something. Like, I don't know what the diagnosis is as to why there's been this six-year stretch of winlessness for a good division. But it, it, it's, it's interesting. And I, I just don't think it holds up anymore with a team as strong as the Summit roster is. I think... Last year, they faced a team in Chicago that was very well prepared and very well game planned for that specific matchup. The Summit came out flat. I don't expect that to happen again. Their coaching staff on the Colorado team is way, way, way too good to allow that to happen again. And I think you could see kind of even the middle part of that game, a lot of gears turning on that Summit sideline about what do we need to do to make sure this never happens again? You could, you could just see it in a little bit of their faces and the way that they were playmaking down the stretch and just sort of like mm -hmm. battling a little bit on otherwise silly little possessions. Uh, I, I just, I, I have a lot of trust in Colorado and I really think that they're going to make a push for maybe being the best team in the league this year. And I, I am just circling that matchup over and over again. And what is it, week 12 when they host New York? That's, New York game that yeah. could be a possible championship preview. I think there's a there's a yeah. handful of them on the schedule this year, but that one has to be number one with a bullet. 
Yeah, I I hope it is. I think I want to agree with you in that I would buy Colorado winning a game at championship weekend. But if you think about it, I'm only like confident that they would beat the Central Division representative. I'm not confident that they'd beat the South or the East representative. They lost to so the, kinda like if, the last if you, year. What? They lost to the Central last year. They did. <laughs> they did. I mean, I think this is this is probably the the lowest tier central division we've seen in in ever maybe in recent history. Like I think Central has their lowest chance of winning a game at championship weekend as they ever have. I think Colorado they they could match up well with like Carolina or Austin or Atlanta whoever comes from the south. But against the east opponent, like if they draw a DC or New York in that first semifinal game i do not see them winning that game so it's tough i i'm i guess i'll, I'll just disagree with you I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll lock in the selling uh of colorado winning at least a game at championship weekend i just i, I don't know they're still kind of in prove it mode to me at that level i guess the whole west division is just because in the time i've been following the league i have i've i've seen the west division have like an incredible regular season run like san, san diego in both 2019 and 2021 and then Colorado last year. And then it comes a championship weekend and they just look, it just looks like another league that they're stepping into and they just look a little bit unprepared. So until I really see it from Colorado, I can't with confidence say that they will win a game at championship weekend. Okay. All right. Well, not going to forget it this time. I'll go through my playoff picks really quick. Uh, Colorado won. Yes. LA to Salt Lake three. And I think Colorado will represent the division at championship weekend. That's the, that's the only division we agree a hundred percent on. I, I think oh, yeah. LA, yeah. LA to me, like the three seed is their floor. So I, I, I just think that they will outperform <sighs> what I'm expecting from them. I, I think it could become a four team playoff race pretty quick in the you West. You think, oh, you really oh, like Oakland I, I'm, to, to I'm, work their way into I'm things. I'm buying into the Oakland hype. I really like strong throwing groups for competitive teams. That's fair. That's a fundamental building block. And with yeah. Justin Norton, Magsig, Keenan Norton's bringing in Mac Hack. They've got Jacob a lot. There's a good thrower. I'm, I'm sure I'm free. Chris Long, their all-star representative, had a great <laughs> season last year. He only completed 89% yeah. of his throws. I expect that number to go up a bit. I, I think I wrote about they're it. They're so young of, still. They're so young. And I think that they're one of those teams who you go. I, I remember when they were 0-5, I was trying to think of ways to not talk about them in terms of like their winlessness. And I was going into mm -hmm. their team stats and they were middle of the pack still while they were winless in a host of team stats like defensive efficiency, total team completions, which they led the league in at the end of the season last year. Like they have... Mm -hmm good metrics or good bones to what would otherwise be a fairly competitive team. And I just, sure. they've got that buy-in. A whole group of them showed up to the all-star game up in Portland and were like the biggest fans along the sideline. Like, yeah, there, there's something there, you know, eight legs, one heart. I, I think that they're <laughs> going to cause some ruckus for some teams that don't take them seriously in that playoff race. And they whether will. that is LA or Salt Lake, or possibly even Colorado that has to learn that lesson the hard ways. I think the spiders are kind of ready. Like I, I just, I think the teams that you and I have agreed upon are, are, you know, the, the, the most known, like that's, I think what we keep going back to yeah. at this point with the season. Sure. Nine, but uh, I don't, I, I like the spiders and I think, you know, Seattle keeps Seattle keeps mentioning that they're going to take a game or two off of someone important this year, or make a little bit more noise than they have the past two seasons when they've won five combined games. But Cascades always wreck someone's season. It feels like. Right. I will say the West has the most potential to like have the non-playoff teams kind of muddy up the playoff picture. Because honestly, with Portland too, I have no idea what we're going to get with Portland this year. Obviously, they started looking like a guaranteed playoff team last year, quickly faded off with a lot of roster inconsistency, but they've returned Leandro Marks. They've got a lot of those core like top players in place. The question is just how much do we see them this year? And then San Diego, 
I know San Diego is is just not happy with the way things have been happening and unfolding this season or this offseason in SoCal, but I still stand by San Diego LA rivalries like really being somewhat of a toss up whenever those two teams meet. Travis Dunn is still back. As far as I'm concerned, that's all that matters for San Diego. If you want consistency, there is not a yeah. more consistent offensive producer in this league than Travis right. Dunn in the past four So seasons. you can't count them out either. So, right. yeah, I, I'm excited. It'll be a good division. The Wild Wild West. Well, we're only three days away now from things kicking off this Friday, April 28th. Seattle will be visiting the Salt Lake Shred live on audl.tv you can go to audl.com to see the exact uh opening poll time as i'm not exact i think it's 10 p.m eastern it's 10 p.m eastern i actually yeah, know it. it's 10, 10 p.m eastern that's right but that will kick off the 2023 season there will be seven total games this weekend on week one highlighted by the game of the week with dc traveling to face the carolina flyers in what should be a great great interdivisional showcase to kick off the season we will be tuning in and we will in fact be back on thursday for a weekly preview of some of those matchups you're going to want to tune in again there thanks everyone for checking us out as always this is swing pass we'll be seeing you soon